All right. Our first song this morning is going to be We Will Glorify. Mm -hmm. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the As well, here in a few moments, we'll be having our lesson. Today's lesson is going to be on the titles of Jesus. That's going to be our series that we're going to be going through, and the first of which is the King, Christ as our King. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Within these words are a number of concepts, the first of which being that God was the first king over Israel. He was the king before Saul was ever king. And what ended up taking place was that the people had rejected him from being their king. Now that's something we want to look into today. Who is our king today? And what does it mean to be rejecting the king? What did the people do that they had rejected him? So in a few minutes, we'll be looking over that. As well, in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll be doing our Lord's Supper. And in doing so, we'll have these packets. So if you haven't grabbed one already, we have some at the back there or over by the front doors that you can get your communion packs. And again, you want to be able to do so because in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll be doing that. But at this time, now I'll hand it over to Steve Woodside for the opening prayer. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, the first day of the week, the day that is appointed that we should worship you. We thank you for that opportunity. We also thank you for sending your Son that we might have a home in heaven. Heavenly Father, um, all things that we enjoy are created by you. And uh, we come to you in prayer today uh, on behalf of some of our members who are um, infirmed, shut in, and uh, recovering from medical procedures and facing medical procedures. We're especially mindful of Bill Fix and his recent surgery. Be with him, help him to heal, and uh, also um, be with him as he recovers from that. Also, we're mindful of the pages who are shut in, who recently suffered from COVID, and that they are getting over that. Thank you for that blessing for them. Prayers answered. Also, the Basses who are str struggling um, as they get older. Also, my mother who struggles um, from, from neuropathy. Also, we're mindful of um, Ken Philpy, who recently had a fall and was in the hospital. 
um, be with him and Charlene as they face that, help him to heal up. Also, there are others that, that in this church that are uh, facing medical issues, be with them and uh, be with the hands that are the doctors that are ministering to them. Also, we're mindful of Michael that's away um, in the Middle East. Also, Heavenly Father, we're mindful of this world is, um, is um, facing many struggles of good versus evil. Heavenly Father, um, we ask in our prayer that um, you um, help us, the, the people in the world that are good outshine the people that are bad. Also be with the leaders of our country and this world that they make good decisions and uh, can come to a conclusion of this um, strife and envy. Also, Heavenly Father, forgive us of our sins, the ones that we've done knowingly and unknowingly, that we might have a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, teach me, Lord, to wait. Teach me, Lord, to wait right down on my knees till in your own good time you
of me as it's inscribed on this table behind me in Luke 22 19 we read and he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them and, and say this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me I think the key words in this passage are do this in remembrance of me that's the message Jesus was addressing to his apostles as they gathered for the Last Supper that they remember him and his sacrifice, the importance of his sacrifice, the reason for his sacrifice, the blood that he was about to shed, the body that he was about to give up. In Matthew, 22, Matthew 26, 27, and 28 we read, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In John 6, 53 through 58, we read, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the Father ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. I really like that passage, it says so much. We proudly gather each first day of the week to remember this event, the shedding of his blood for our sins. And finally, in Hebrews 9.22 and in John 3, we read, for without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I invite you at this time to take out your bread And pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day, for this time, for this opportunity to remember your sacrifice, the body that you shed, the blood that you shed, the love that you showed for us so that we may have that hope of eternal life with you. We ask you to be with us now as we partake of this bread which represents your son's body that he so willingly gave for us. We ask that you be with us, that you bless us as we partake. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let us continue in prayer for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue in prayer at this time for the fruit of the vine who represents your son's shed blood, that he so willingly went to the cross in our stead. We ask that you be with us as we partake, that we think back on that event, the time, the suffering, 
the sacrifice, and again the love that he gave and showed for us. As we partake now, we ask that you be with us, that you love us, and you continue to bless us always. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Part of our worship service we're able to do through giving and so we've done as much as we can to try and make the giving process as easy as possible the first of which is to be able to go onto the website followthebible.com and you can follow the links there to be able to offer your gift or you can text the word give to 714-450-7010 you we also have the contribution boxes over by the doors. So if you wanted to drop off your contribution there, you're able to do so. Or you can mail in, and the address is Orangeview Church 13211 on Fairview Street, Garden Grove, California, 92843. Tried to set this up to give you the opportunity to be able to give, as that is a command in which we are given in order to participate in the worship process. Now here in just a few minutes, we'll be having our sermon. We're going to be starting the series of the titles of Jesus. Our sermon is going to be about the first of the titles being the king. Uh, and before we do that, we'll be having about a five-minute break. During that time, you'll be able to stand up, uh, kind of stretch your legs, be able to check up on one another, see what's going on in each other's lives, maybe someone you haven't seen in a while, or to say hello to our visitors. We have some with us today. And so that gives you the chance to be able to do that. And we'll also have our Kids pack up here, which are going to be crosswords and word search corresponding with today's lesson to be able to keep them, uh, the kids involved in uh, following through or following along through the word search. We also have our bulletin, so you can go and text the word OV Weekly to 94,000. That'll get you a digital copy of the bulletin. But we also have our physical copies up here that we can be handing out, uh, which give you an opportunity to stay plugged in and, and see what's going on and to read the articles and uh, things that we have put in there. So at this time now, we'll take a, fi a five minute break. We will be singing, He's My King. Do so mi so do. All day long of Jesus I am singing. He's my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. He's my King and no I dearly love him. He's my King. No other is above him. 
was swinging your hands, singing and reading, and then flipping the little button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. I'm surprised I kept my head about me. All right. Well, today we're looking into, as, I, as we said before, the titles of Jesus. I mean, one of the things is, is that Jesus holds many, many roles for us. And one of the foremost roles is he serves as king. Now, what's an interesting thing is that when we look over into the Old Testament, we can get a picture of God and how he works, and we can come to understand him all the better from reading the way that his plan and how he functioned within the Old Testament. And that gives us insight as to what we're dealing with today. And so as we try and understand the idea of a king, you have this nation of people who came from a single man from Abraham, and Abraham's children came off until you get to the 12 tribes, and then the 12 tribes continued to grow and spread. And last week we were looking at Joseph, where they make their way to Egypt, and then they become this massive number of people who are flourishing there in the land of Goshen. And when they leave Egypt in the great exodus, and you have them being led out by God with Moses standing in front of them. And just a few generations later, it's always wild to me when I look at the statement in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. Because this is only two generations separated. And it says, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. You have a group of people who are being led by God, and you have a group of people who very quickly forget that reality. In fact, at the end of the book of Judges, where you have, right away, you see this, this separation from their relationship with God taking place within the nation. You see at the end of the book, this statement, which shows up a number of times, uh, which says, in those days... There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that was the problem. People were doing what they thought was right. It's almost as if the writer is making the statement, if only there was a king in Israel. Then we would have order. We would have justice. So there, there was no king in Israel. But, of course, we need to ask ourselves, is that true? Was there really no king in Israel? The true king of Israel becomes revealed very quickly when you're looking through the Old Testament. Let's look at God's relationship with Israel. I mean, God is serving as their king. I already made that statement, and I hold true to that statement. And let's look at the, the way in which he interacts with the people, because God is the people's provider. Again, we go to Exodus, and we're talking about how they had left that great nation and made their way out. When you look in Exodus chapter 3, 16 through 17, God tells Moses, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prizites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. God is providing for this people of his, which he is going to bring out of Egypt and take them into the land flowing with milk and honey. In Deuteronomy eleven thirteen through 17, says, and if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all, or with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. 
when God is bringing them over into the land of milk and honey, he outright tells them in Deuteronomy, in Moses' last sermon, in his last moments before that generation, after the wilderness generation, goes to take the land, he lets them know God is the one who is providing all of this to you. When things are going well, God is giving that to you. If you are not obeying God, God is shutting it out from you. God is providing for this nation. We look further into God's relationship. God is leading them. I mean, yes, it's, it's Moses who is the one who brings them out of Exodus. He is, the, he is the forefront man who's there. But who's the one who's directing Moses? Exodus 4.12. Now therefore go and I will be with you, your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Everything that he said, everything that Moses did, this was from the commandment of God. God was the one who was leading the people through Moses. It wasn't that Moses was their leader. God was their leader. Exodus 40, 34 through 37 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journey, whenever the cloud was taken up from, uh, from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. I mean, there's the statement right there. When they left, they left because God had left. When they stay, it's because God's there. I mean, you think about that. What an awesome experience that would actually be to have the presence of God right there in your midst among the tabernacle. I mean, that is just an incredible thing for me to try and conceptualize. God is right there, observable to the people. Moses waits for God to leave before he says, okay, we go. He isn't the one who's saying, now we leave. He's saying, we wait for God. God's the one who is leading them through all of this. He is their leader, and of course, he, he's their lawgiver. I mean, we call it the law of Moses. That was how it was known in the day of Jesus. They'd very frequently look back to the law of Moses, the law. But where did the law come from? Exodus 24, verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I mean, it comes from, from God. He was the one. He laid out the rules. He laid out the law. The people said, We listen to God. Now, of course, we already looked in Judges chapter 2. Not too long later, there's a people that say that they do not know the Lord. And even this generation who's standing here saying we will do what God says end up having to wander the wilderness for the 40 years because they didn't listen. But when it comes down to it, God is the one who is reigning over them. He is the one who's in charge. And he serves as their sovereign, their, their supreme authority. In all things, he is the one who has the authority over what happens to that nation. Jeremiah 32, 38. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Now that was the intended dynamic that was supposed to be taking place there in Israel. Unfortunately, this is looking forward because this is saying, well, since they didn't do that, I'm going to set up a new covenant and this is going to be the dynamic. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Exodus 23 through 6, we look at this. And God gives these words in reference towards the fact that he has supreme authority. There's, there's nobody above him. He is first and foremost. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a, card, a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water beneath under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for the Lord your God, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. 
the statement is, is presented. There's, there's no other God. You have many, many gods that are existing among the people, these idols. As they're making their way into the land of Canaan, this is an idolatrous people in an idolatrous land. God tells them, no, there's, there's no other God before me. You don't even entertain another God. Why? Because God is the supreme authority. So we think back, we look at that question, that statement that we saw in Judges 21. There was no king in Israel. Is that statement true? Now I've already, I, I've made this statement that I'm, I'm standing in opposition to that. And in fact, the word itself does. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12 tells us that God is the true king and ruler of Israel. I mean, that was always the power dynamic that had been structured. 1 Samuel chapter 12, 12 says, And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your king. I mean, this is the people looking forward. They're trying to get a, a king established. I mean, that's one of the biggest travesties that takes place in the book of 1 Samuel is the implementation of a king. Because Samuel looks at them as they're dealing with the many strifes that they have before them, and he, he puts before them, the Lord your God was your king. Here's the thing is that the people outright rejected God. They chose to reject God as their king. 1 Samuel chapter 8, 4 through 8, that's them making that statement that we want a king. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are, do, so they are also doing to you. People said, Samuel, we, you're, you're no longer able to rule over us. Your children can't follow after you. We need a king, a line in which we can go to. They make this statement so that we can be like the other nations. You know what? That's exactly what they look like. The other nations. Happened very quickly. Here you have these people, these special people who belong to God, who God is leading them in their midst, who is directly in front of them. And they say, we want a king to be like the other nations. Well, that had an inevitable result. They did look like the other nations. In fact, when you go over to the northern kingdom, we were looking through the kings not too long ago uh, in our Sunday morning class. None of the northern kingdoms were a good, none of the northern kings were a good king. And in the southern king, kingdom, yeah, you had a few good kings. Definitely you had some. But the result, when you look at these kings that showed up, is this man Manasseh. He ended up coming through. And in 2 Kings chapter 23, 26 through 27, says, Still the Lord did not turn from the burning, or burning of his great wrath, by which his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said my name shall be there. And they rejected God. They brought in this wicked, evil king who it said that, that the streets of Jerusalem that was, the, the streets were, of Jerusalem were lined with blood because of the acts that he was doing, sacrificing his own children. 
mean, this was a wicked, terrible man. And this is the following result of saying that we want to be like the other nations. We need a king to rule us and judge us like the other nations. I mean, when you see the, the great rulers that had come forward, leading the people, I mean, from Moses, well, Moses wasn't even given the opportunity to, um, to enter the land of Canaan, to the promised land of milk and honey because of his mistakes. I mean, David and his mistakes and the blood that was on his hand, he was told, you can't build the temple. Solomon, one of the great kings of the United Kingdom, when we're looking at these people, well, even Solomon had given in in all of his wisdom to the idolatry of his wives. I mean, none of these kings in which they had put over was able to serve and deliver the people in the way that God could do for them. Now, here's the reality. We looked at that. I mean, this is, it, it can be a sad message when we read through the Old Testament and see how things turned out because it's continual rejection of God. Now we need to flip the lens back over onto ourselves because the reality is we have a king ourselves. You know, in the United States, and we look at this and we say, oh, yeah, well, we don't have a king. We have a president. That's absolutely true. But us here in this building, we have a king. Those who put on the name of Christian, those who belong to Christ, they have a king. We have a king. So let's look at our our king. In fact, this was a king which was talked about, a king that will be coming ever since the Old Testament. Zechariah presents this king that is going to be coming. He says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Look at that. They're looking forward. This this is the king who's going to make his way over. He's going to bring salvation. In Daniel chapter 2, it's looking forward to the kingdom which is going to be established, that is going to be put forward that the people are going to be a part of, that this king is going to rule in. Daniel 2, 44 through 45. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. This is Nebuchadnezzar. He has, he has this dream of this great statue of gold and silver, bronze, iron, and then clay and iron mixed together. He sees the entire thing crumble. Daniel tells him, this is the king God is establishing. It is an everlasting kingdom. This was the anticipated kingdom that the people were looking forward to. And when it comes down to that kingdom, that kingdom has been brought over. Christ had come in as that king. I mean, in fact, Christ is just the the Greek word for Messiah, which is the, is the Hebrew word for anointed. They're all the same word, the anointed king. When we call him the Christ, we're, we're essentially, we're calling him the king. And he is the one that had accomplished what these men were looking forward to in Zechariah and Daniel. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. This is such a powerful verse. I think I've pulled it up a few times in the last few weeks, and we're looking at it again. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus put himself into this position of being our king, and that came at the cost of dying upon the cross in his obedience. But the result is he is the utmost king. He is the sovereign king, the supreme authority. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, as Paul's writing to the young evangelist Timothy, his friend, he says, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords. The king, he's, he's the king above all kings, the lord above all lords. He is the only one with supreme authority. That is our king. And he is a king unlike any other. Again, we were, we were talking about some of the rulers that have showed up before. Moses, David, Solomon, even some of the good kings of the southern kingdom. Hezekiah, Josiah. I mean, those, those are some great men that you can really pull out. Some examples of men that you want to follow. None of them even scrape the kind of king that we have in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 14, for, or chapter 2, 14 through 18. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Those are powerful words. Christ became like the people. He died like the people. Who can really think of a king who will sacrifice himself for the people, who will put himself into an, an awful position for the sake of the people. I mean, usually you think about it and it's, it's the other way around. The person who is the utmost authority, well, one of the pleasures they get to receive is they don't have to go off into battle. They get to send others out into battle. But Christ, he didn't just go into battle. He single-handedly won the battle. He overcame the devil. That's already happened. Now it's up to us as far as what side we want to end up on in the end. But the victory has already been won. It's assured. It's happened. We don't have to worry about the rest. We just need to worry about whether or not we follow our king. Because when it comes down to it, he is an awesome, awesome king above any other. Oh, and I forgot to read this part right here. I'll read that. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. In fact, I'll, I'll expand, uh, expand upon that a little bit too, because when it comes down to exactly what he had done, he had done so in order to bring us help. I mean, he is a king of service. That's the entire concept. He is a king of utmost service. It's not that the people serve the king. The king serves the people. And then we do ourselves return that service. But first and foremost, he is a, a king of the people. So we think about that. that he's our king. We, we want a king like that, don't we? We want to say, that is my king. Well, then we got to think about what it means to be a part of that kingdom. We're offered citizenship in that kingdom. You know, Paul puts it this way in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Right? That, that's an awesome thing. You know, with all the terrible things, we, we look at the United States, and sometimes, I've, I mean, I've heard this, I've said this, I've looked upon it, and think, you know, the country is going in, the, in a bad direction. It's going in the wrong direction. That's okay. My citizenship's in heaven. I don't have to worry about that. When it comes down to it, the leaders of this country may make their way all the way into the furthest direction from where I want to be. My king is Christ. My citizenship, my kingdom is heaven. And there's great assurance. There's great hope in that statement. So we want to be a part of that kingdom, but we need to recognize our king. He is a king who is worthy of our dedication, king worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our imitation. And remember what we just read in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who gave of himself. He served the people. He, put, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Those are the words of Paul. Now he says, Have this mindset among yourselves. This serving king who serves the people be like him. Serve each other. Become obedient. Not only is he worthy of our imitation, he's worthy of our confession. I mean, we're talking about how great of a king he is. We should not ever be ashamed to say that he's my king. Matthew chapter 10, 28 through 33 makes this statement. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. When we see that, that's, that's saying that's where fear, real fear lies. Not with the things that happen in, in the world and these, this form of a kingdom. Remember, our, our citizenship's in heaven. That's where our concern lies. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. And this is the important part. He says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Rejection of Christ is rejection of our citizenship. When it comes down to it, we should be elated to proclaim Christ is our King. When we think about the concept of the gospel, you know, the word gospel is just good news. You know when they used the word gospel when they used good news it was a way of heralding in a new king we did, they didn't have the form of communication that we have today instead it was all done through the spread of word of mouth when a new king was put in charge of a kingdom it's not like those who were all the way on the outskirts knew oh hey we're under a new rule no so they'd send a herald out who would go out proclaiming good news our new king is this person. Good news, this is our new king. Now we have the ability ourselves to make that proclamation. Good news, Christ is our king. Jesus is our king. Good news, everyone. It's a beautiful statement. When we think about proclaiming Christ, we should be ready to exclaim good news to everybody. This is who I serve. This is my king. Look at how great he is. Look at all of the, the accomplishments he has been able to do. That's why I serve him. He's worthy of our imitation, worthy of our confession, and absolutely worthy of our praise. And that's why we come here. We're here. We, we, we praise God. We praise Christ. We are ever grateful for the kingdom that we have the opportunity, the privilege to be a part of. Psalm 145 states, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. 
Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and great to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. That is praise. Praise to God. And it, and it gives us the reason there. Look at the works that he's done. Look at what he has accomplished. This is why the psalmist is saying you are worthy of our praise because of everything that you have done for us up till this point. It's not just an arbitrary concept. This is, this is the reasoning. It gives us the definition of what we need to be thinking about here. And that is where Christ falls into. He is our king. He is our Lord. He is our God. I mean, what an awesome concept that is. King of all kings, Lord of all lords. So when it comes down to the very concept of what we're looking at here, I mean, how important is that relationship with your king? How willing are you to sacrifice for the king who sacrificed for you? I mean, part of the very concept that we're looking at here includes sacrifice for our neighbor, sacrifice for our brother, relationship with him, with God. We have the ability to go to God in prayer. A direct line of communication afforded us by Christ, assisted through the Holy Spirit, that we are able to come to God and pray. I mean, I always think, what, a, what an awesome thing. I made such a big deal about the tabernacle having the, the, the cloud over it, having God there in their midst. Well, you know what? We have a direct line of communication with God. What an awesome concept that is. We have such an amazing set of things set before us. A God who cares, who had done all of these amazing things for us. So the question becomes, how willing am I to reciprocate, to acknowledge, and to proclaim that king? That's what I want us to meditate on for today. Join me in prayer. Our awesome and heavenly Father, Lord, we are ever grateful for you, for your kingdom, for all that you have established for us that we may be able to proudly say we are your people. We're grateful that you had extended this relationship over to us, a kingdom that you had given at the cost of your son. We know that all this was done for our sake. Help us to never forget that. As well, Lord, we are ever grateful for your son who had set all of this in motion, who serves as the perfect king. Help us in serving him as we attempt to carry out his will and your will. We are ever grateful for all that you do. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, Zion's call. Zion's call sweetly ring over land and sea, bidding us look to us above, while the light from the throne shines for you. Oh, God.
things and so I have the ability to set up the announcements and first of all I want to say that uh, so Bill has made his way over into the rehab facility it's the St. Jude rehab right over there in Fullerton and uh, so things have been going well I know that the doctor's given him a good report and he's dealing with some pain unfortunately because of the way that the surgery has just worked out and he's got a little bit more nerves in that area of the leg, so it's caused him more pain through that process. Um, so we want to keep him in our prayers. 